Okay, so this is a continuation of the lecture. Now I'm gonna talk about hepatitis B virus. Okay, so unlike hepatitis A and hepatitis B, which are naked viruses and they're transmitted, I had already said through the fecal order route, hepatitis B is an enveloped virus. It's very resistant to an enveloped virus. Do that. Sometimes you can, you can, it can live for seven days at 44 degrees Celsius. This is a very resistant virus, and it's an exception considering the fact that it's an enveloped virus. In this virus, you're going to have the surface antigen. You're going to have the core protein that's going to make up the eicosahedral capsid, and you're going to have a polymerase protein that will attach to the viral genome. One other peculiar thing about this virus is that it's class 7 in the Baltimore classification. Do you remember what's that? When we talked about class 7, it means retrovirus. This is one of the retrovirulent family. Hmm? It's a retrovirus family. It has a part double-stranded RNA. That's very, very peculiar and very weird. And we're going to see how it is a retrovirus. It is part of the uh, HEPA-DNA hepa virus because it's, a, because it's a DNA. Okay, HEPA-DNA virus. And um, like I said, it's class 7, the Baltimore classification, so it's a retrovirus. It has eight strains from A to H. And they kind of they kind of differ in the resistance to interferon and in the rate of chronicity. And they all share the antigen. Now the variation is in the antigen sequence. You have to consider three different things. They have the same epitope A in the antigen, and they have two variant position at position 21, 22, either it's gonna be a lysine or an arginine, or two variant at a position. 160. So if you actually do the probability, you're going to have four different serotypes that are here. Either you're going to have ABW, AYW, ATR, or AYR. Now if you take a look at the geographical distribution, the HBV genotype, each um, part of the world is going to have two different genotypes going from A to H. Such as in Europe, you're, you can have, you're going to have the A serotype and the T serotype, for example. And you know, you can see the rest, you know, except in Australia, you're going to have this Okay, so this virus, it replicates in the hepatocyte. It doesn't have a lytic uh, infection. The attachment protein is not really known, but we're going we're gonna, to, we can assume it is uh, till now until we can say. And the attachment, the protein, and the fusion, it's going to have a fusion, it's going to fuse with the membrane, it's going to uncoat, the DNA is going to go into the nucleus, and basically, this is where it gets weird. The mRNA encoding for the structural and non-structural protein will be done. A pre-genome, which is called pgRNA, is going to be done. The pgRNA is going to be packaged into the nucleic acid in the cytoplasm. And then you're going to have the protein P, where we had already said, you know, if I go back, this is a protein that is packaged with the virus. You're going to have the protein P. This is a reverse transcriptase. So again, we have the pgRNA. You're going to have the protein P, which is a reverse transcriptase. It's packaged in the nucleic acid. And basically, the surface protein that are expressed on the ER will envelope the virus, and the virus is going to be exocytosed at the cell. What will happen in the cell, in the nucleic acid, outside of the cell after exocytosis, is this protein, P protein, is going to reverse transcribe the RNA into a partial double strand DNA and it has an RNA's intrinsic activity so basically it's going to degrade the RNA okay and you're going to be left with a partial double strand DNA with a P protein inside the nucleocapsid now the genome is going to encode for seven different proteins you're going to have the surface antigen and you have three different types of surface antigen either you're going to have the SS which is for short surface antigen, medium SM, and long SM. Now you're going to have the core protein, which is an HBC, abbreviated as HBC antigen of the nucleocapsid. You have the antigen lure, which is a marker used as a marker for viral replication. It's HBE antigen, 
the X transcription and replication factor, which is important for carcinogenesis and, of course, the DNA polymerase. Another peculiar thing about this virus is this right here. So we already had said in the nucleus, you're going to have the pgRNA that is synthesized. pgRNA is carried outside. It's packaged with the P protein in the nucleocapsid. And basically, the P protein, like I said, will do the reverse transcription into your DNA. It will bud out of the endoplasmic reticulum, and by exocytosis, it will go out. But this is not the only particle that is released from the infected cell. This is a full virus that is capable of infecting another hepatocyte that is near. Yet, you have something that is spherical over here that is released, and something that is filamentous over here that is released. And these are what we call the non infectious particles. They're going to express, the filamentous particle is going to express all over the HBS antigen. While some viruses are even released, only the core virus without the envelope. So this, is, this virus is not going to be able to attach to the cell in no way possible. It's not going to be able to fuse. So we wonder why this virus is released only as a core virus and why sometimes this virus is released without the core only as the envelope or the S protein. This is actually to inhibit the immune response. This is one other way other than resisting interferon. This is one other way to inhibit the immune response. Why? Because these over here, these particles, when basically assemble with the, and, uh, the antibodies and they will make complexes. And this fully capable virus of infecting another cell will escape and they will be able to infect other cells. And this full virus and complete infectious, infectious virion is called the Dane particle. So this is how one way of diverting the immune response. Okay, so uh, you can see here is the epidemiology map. You can see over here in red, you're going to have really, you know, all over the world, you're going to have the viral HPV infection. You have 240 million people worldwide are living with chronic hepatitis. So uh, chronic hepatitis, we are, uh, I'm sorry, HPV is actually transmitted to serum hepatitis, right? So we already had said in the first part of the lecture that you have the uh, infectious, which is A and E, that are transmitted horizontally, and this is a serum hepatitis. So it's transmitted by exchanging biological fluids. One of the most important biological fluids to exchange is blood. The second most important is actually um, uh, sexual secretion. But this virus is transmitted by milk, so it's transmitted in a vertical way. This virus is transmitted by urine and by saliva. It's very, very infectious. And like I had already mentioned, it's very resistant. Compared to another enveloped virus, this virus will be able to actually resist 44 degrees temperature for seven days. You, we already had said, mentioned the horizontal transmission and the vertical transmission. So who are the high-risk population? Since the mode of transmission requires the exchange of fluids, most of the time, this will actually, the high-risk population are drug users, IV drug users, uh, the people who receive blood, homosexuals, sexual workers, healthcare, and partners, of course, of infected individuals, and people in the household of the infected individual. So these are the high-risk factors. So when you're donating blood, they're actually asking you, do you have multiple sex partners? Are you an IV drug user? Uh, do you have a sex, have you had a sexual contact? Is anybody in your household infected? These are all, all risk factors that actually are very associated with hepatitis B transmission. So the initial infection is through the blood. Uh, I'm sorry, it's through a needle prick, for instance. For instance, medical, the medical community, you can have a, through a needle prick, let's say, uh, hepatitis B, or it can be a vertical transmission of hepatitis B. It's gonna go in the blood, and it's gonna cause a first viremia, and it's gonna go to the liver. And then, after a second viremia, where is it gonna go? It's gonna go to all the fluids in your body. And please note, it's not gonna go to the connective tissues. It's gonna go to the fluids. It's gonna go, it's gonna dissipate to the saliva, the semen, the blood, 
vaginal secretion and the mother's milk. And this is how it's going to be transmitted. Okay, so I have already said that. So, what is the hepatitis, uh, the immunity against hepatitis C? So, the first immunity, of course, is the CTR response for uh, cytopathic clearance, interferon gamma for uh, resisting the viral infection by other hepatocytes. Antibodies that are going to neutralize, but this is, I have already mentioned what's the problem with antibodies, that the virus is able to actually escape antibodies, and uh, sometimes these are going to cause serum sickness and the accumulation of the joints, like any other antibody antigen complex in our body that is able to accumulate in the joint, and it's able to cause the serum sickness. Okay, so here is a very, very important graph, where we're going to see the evolution of an acute hepatitis. So here is the month after the exposure and over here at time zero we're gonna have the exposure. You can see that the incubation period is very long and this of course these are the liver enzyme um, and this these are the different antibodies. So the liver enzymes after two months look at the whole this this period um, the liver enzymes, after two months, they will, start, they will start grazing. And during this whole period, the patient, asymptomatic patient, is going to be very, very infected. And at this point, you're going to see HBE in the blood. You're going to see HBS antigens in the blood. You're not going to see HBC antigen. Why? Because at the point where the virus is replicating, you're going to have directly the anti-HPC that is going up and it's going to neutralize this. Yet, for HBE, which is an indicator of viral replication, sometimes it's used as an indicator for viral replication, the antibodies are going to take a longer time to appear. Now, the HBS, they're going to appear first. If you do the serology of this person, they're going to appear first and then they're going to disappear and then you're going to have after the disappearance, you're going to have the appearance of anti-HBS antibody. Look at when? Five and a half months after infection. And this is where the disappearance of HBS antigens, this is what is called the HBS antigen window. Okay, so HBS antigen window, it does not mean that the person is not infected with hepatitis B. This is a trick. Sometimes a lot of clinicians, they're not able to detect it. Why? Because they're actually trying to detect the HBS antigen or even the antibodies. Look, even over here in the window, the antibodies are not there. So you're not going to have in the serum of that person, if you actually try to detect it, you're not going to have HBS and you're not going to have anti-HBS. Why? Because the concentration of HBS is equal to the concentration of antibodies against HBS. In this window over here, everything's complex together. So what you're testing for, which is the free virions or the free anti-HBS are not there, okay? So this is where the serology it might be misleading. So in order to make a really good test, you always have to test for HBC. Look, HBC is always, always, always up, you know, from the place, from the uh, starting of jaundice, for instance, and the starting of symptoms till the end of the infection. You have to pay really close attention to that. So, evolution of chronic hepatitis B. Now, in chronic hepatitis B, you can see that you're going to have an elevation of the liver enzyme and then you're going to have the reduction of the liver enzyme. So, basically, at one point, after six months, the liver enzymes are going to be reduced and the symptoms are going to disappear, but you're still in this chronic phase. You're still producing viruses. You see, the HBS antigen is always in the blood. You're still producing anti-HBC and you're still producing you're saying you're, you're still having virus shredding and this chronic phase is characterized by where you're not gonna have an anti-HBS okay so um, after 45 days of incubation you're gonna have an insidious onset of fatigue a fever vomiting so if you have an efficient immunity you're gonna go through an acute in hepatitis B. You're gonna go through an acute phase and then you're gonna 
uh, it's going to be followed by remission. In the acute phase, you may have symptoms such as jaundice, dark urine that will last for one or two months. But if the person has a very weak immunity or very weak immune response, they may go into a chronic phase and these are 10% of the patient. The chronic phase can be with or without viral active replication. So basically in this case, uh, the immune system is controlling the virus, but the virus is still there. Okay, but it's controlling the symptoms and it's controlling the virus. If you have a chronic hepatitis, you can either have, uh, if it is not active, you can have an extra hepatic disease. If it's active, you may have cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. Cirrhosis because of a high rate of, you know, hepatocytes dying and then regeneration. This high rate of regeneration will allow the liver to fail at one point and to have cirrhosis or have hepatocellular carcinoma. The complications of hepatitis B can be fluminant hepatitis, can be liver cirrhosis, or like I said, hepatocellular carcinoma. Why? Why do we have hepatocellular carcinoma? It's due to two different things, what we call mitogenesis and what we call mutagenesis. Okay. So in chronic hepatitis, you're going to have the destruction of hepatocytes, okay, and you're going to have a regeneration. So at every single destruction of a hepatic cell, you're going to have another hepatic cell that is actually made or that is actually made from the stem cell. And you all know that mutations are there. The possibility of a mutation is there when you're going through the mitotic cycle, right? And this is what we call the mitogenesis. Now, the mutagenesis is due to the activation of the X gene. Remember this X protein at the beginning? And this may integrate the genome into the cell. Upon integration, it's going to basically cause an overgrowth and it's going to basically cause hepatocellular carcinoma. This is a serology of diagnosis of hepatitis B. This is acute hepatitis B and this is, you know, um, chronic hepatitis B. You can see that anti-HBS is there for acute hepatitis B and it's not elevated in chronic hepatitis B. You know, there's a really huge shift in the serum uh, concentration of anti-hepatitis. One is negative, one is positive. Okay, so how do you treat, how do you control, how do you prevent? Practicing safe sex really really having a lot of control on blood transfusion because it's a very high rate um, the treatment is interferon alpha anti for antiviral replication or it can be a nucleotide that will inhibit the viral replication uh, sometime after a needle prick and um, you, you know if, if you know that this person has hepatitis and you have a needle prick or after a liver transplant uh, as a prophylaxis, they may give you uh, the hepatitis B uh, antibodies. And basically, sometimes you have a recombinant vaccine that is given. Uh, the recombinant vaccine is a very, very efficient vaccine. Very efficient, okay? 95% efficacy. The duration is more than 20 years. So if, if they, somebody had told you that, okay, you need a lot of boosters of hepatitis B, this is actually not true. The immunity is going to last for more than 20 years. Not only that, uh, sometimes people, they have a weak CTR response and sometimes they're not responsive to a vaccine. So sometimes if you have a vaccine of hepatitis B, some people are not responsive to that vaccination and they're not going to produce antibodies and you need to know about these people. It doesn't mean that their immune system is, fault, is faulty or there's something wrong with their immune system. It means that they're mediating probably the infection towards um, hepatitis B with CTL and not with antibodies, okay? And, um, you know, sometimes it's recommended to go, if you're going through an endemic country, to actually uh, give a dose or for the medical community to give a dose of hepatitis B uh, if the titer of hepatitis B antigen is not there. So uh, the third dose should be separated uh, okay, so you have a dose given at uh, one month interval, and then you have a second dose after five month interval. So, 
What is hepatitis B virus? A uh, D virus. Okay, hepatitis B D virus. It's not a true virus. Okay, it is a um, satellite virus. So if hepatitis B, it's a complication of hepatitis B actually. But if hepatitis B is not present, hepatitis B cannot infect you. It's a satellite virus. It needs the nuclear capsid of hepatitis B. It's a simultaneous infection with hepatitis. B. And what's bad about it, it's that it's going to have a high risk of cirrhosis, high risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and it's going to be controlled through vaccination with hepatitis B. Okay, last but not least, we're going to talk about hepatitis C. Uh, hepatitis C is a positive RNA virus of the Flaviviridae family. It's also enveloped, and basically its genes are going to encode for 10 different proteins. You have a core protein, E1 and E2, and you have non-structural proteins. You have the severity and the resistance for interferon, and the most resistant is actually genotype 1. How is hepatitis C transmitted? Like hepatitis B, but it's not transmitted through milk. It's gonna replicate in the hepatocyte and it's gonna induce immunosuppression. But please keep in mind, hepatitis B is able to insert induce mutagenesis and induce metagenesis, mutagenesis due to the insertion of the viral DNA in the genome. Yet hepatitis C, the D, induction of cancer is not through the insertion in the gene. The induction of cancer is first of all through immunosuppression, second of all through a lot of liver damage because it's inducing constant regeneration. So this is the mitogenesis. The inflammation, it results in the release of free radicals by phagocytes and you remember free radicals that are going to induce a mutation in the DNA of normal cells. And furthermore, the virus is going to block the p53 synthesis. The p53, it's going to lead the cell in ap to apoptosis if the cell uh, is going through a crazy cell cycle and it's highly mutated. So here, apoptosis is reduced. So it's not only the fact that you're accumulating mutations in your cells. If these cells that are mutated die, you're not going to develop cancer. But these cells that are mutated due to the free radical, due to the high cycle, high replication cycle of the cell, okay, and due to the liver damage that will cause high replication in the cell, this uh, disturbance in the cell cycle, it won't be corrected by apoptosis. So apoptosis is inhibited or it's reduced. So there is a high, high frequency of hepatocellular carcinoma in this case. The incubation month is longer from two to four months and basically the symptoms are less. And you can see that hepatitis, the more chronic it is and the more dangerous it is to develop carcinoma, the less symptoms or the milder symptoms that it's going to get, okay? And it may cause an accumulation of immune complexes, arthritis and glomerular nephritis. Okay, so we have 70 million people. They have a chronic hepatitis C. 200 million in the world are seropositive. 3% of the world population, this is, this is very high. Women are twice as much infected as men with hepatitis C. Um, the incidence of cirrhosis is very, very high. And in Egypt, due to this uh, infection of the serum, uh, it has caused cause 22% of the population to have chronic hepatitis C and this is very, very dangerous. Hepatitis C, is serology helpful? No, because um, basically it's, it's only used as screening donors, of course, but you know, uh, the antigens are gonna appear very, very late. Uh, I'm sorry, the antibodies. And monitoring the response of a person taking a drug against hepatitis C is through real-time PCR and the detection of HCV antigen. You have no vaccine, and basically the treatment is with antivirus, uh, virus, uh, adulated interferon gamma, uh, ribavirin, or a triple or quadruple therapy with NS inhibitors. Okay. Uh, let's talk about hepatitis G virus. 
it's, it's really a funny story. Thanks G was discovered in a patient who had acute hepatitis, okay? Um, and this is why the initials were GB and that's why it was called hepatitis G. Uh, it's very weird that we know hepatitis G is transmitted through blood transfusion. Hepatitis G is present in 1-2% to of the world population and 25% are infected during their lifetime. But we don't know, you know, what's the purpose, okay? Furthermore, asymptomatic infection seems to protect against the evolution of AIDS in HIV patients. This is a very weird virus. We don't know what's going on with this virus till now, but it's there and it's worthy to keep in mind and it's very, very ubiquitous, okay? And the infection is very ubiquitous. It may go asymptomatic, but it's very, very ubiquitous. And it was found, you know, in a patient who was suffering from acute hepatitis, they didn't even know about hepatitis G when they found it. So uh, guys, this wraps up our lecture. I'll see you guys in the next one. Um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me.